in the cyclical market, you are automatically a gambler. You are automatically a speculator. Something great has to happen for you to make money, and that something great is appreciation. But what if it doesn't happen? You're, you're going broke because you bought a property where you are losing money every month in order to speculate on a potential future which may never occur. I'd like to welcome to the channel someone I have a tremendous amount of respect for. I have been following this guy for many years and he's really helped me to shape the way I think about investing. He is the leading expert on rental properties and investing, or he calls them income properties. He's the host of the mega popular podcast, Creating Wealth Show. Jason Hartman, thanks for being here, buddy. George, thanks for having me. When we uh, talked just two or three days ago, and one of our clients discovered your YouTube channel and yeah. just loved it, and he said, you mentioned me. So I, of course, I had to check out your videos, and uh, you do a great job explaining some very complex concepts. Hats off to you. I'm sure your listeners really appreciate that. So I've been listening to you since 2012. Some Seven years. The- yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some time. of the viewers that I have might not be too familiar with, with your work. So if you want to make, maybe just give them a 30 second Reader's Digest version of why you are the best in the business. What makes Jason Hartman the best and the most experienced guy out there? Well, well, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I got interested in the real estate business when I was 16 years old. I grew up poor in Los Angeles, California. I did not like being poor very much. And I, I saw a infomercial for a real estate guru, went out and bought his book, read three chapters, put it down. My mom picked it up, read the rest, and uh, you know, kind of just became interested. I got my real estate license my first year in college when I was 19 years old, just before my 20th birthday. Bought my first rental property about six months later when I was 20 years old. And I've been going ever since. I just love this business. And uh, the last 15 years, I've been basically... I'd call myself like a, a financial advisor for real estate investors. For sure, for sure. Where, where we help people invest nationwide, just help them make sense of the investment landscape and, and the economic landscape too, and how we can sort of play the game or really, I should say, almost game the system. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. most people, I'm sure your, your viewers, George, would agree that the way the monetary and fiscal policy is set up, it's, it's, it's really just a giant scam. And yep. it's meant to hurt the little guy. It's meant to hurt the middle class and enrich the elite class. And we can complain about that as much as we want, but we're probably never going to change it. So I just say, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> and mm-hmm. align, you know, we teach people how to align their interest with the two most powerful forces the human race has ever known, maybe maybe excluding God from that. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but, uh, but those two forces are, are governments and central banks, right. very powerful entities. And we just want to align our interests with them so we can make as much money as possible playing their game, if you will. A lot of people ask me, they say, George, how can you do a video on, a, on the housing bubble and then suggest real estate? So right. people have to understand that not only is real estate local, but it's hyper local. So, it's and I know you talk a lot about that on your podcast. So maybe you can explain to us quickly how there are certain markets in the United States that are in this massive bubble, like Los Angeles, San Francisco, mm-hmm. Seattle, but then there are other markets that I like, and I know you like a lot, where the prices are, are much more sane and something that could be interesting even in a time when these other markets are so high? Yeah, a good question. I think it's really helpful if all uh, people interested in investments, in financial success, personal finance, and especially real estate, understand that the entire world can be categorized into three basic types of real estate markets. One is Mm -hmm. the linear market. That's the type we like. Uh, Another one is the cyclical market. 
and another one is the hybrid market, okay? So if we were looking at a chart, and you inspired me, so I'm going to go to the whiteboard here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't use the whiteboard too much, folks, but here's the whiteboard, okay? I do have one. I, I hardly right. ever use it. Very so cool. with the whiteboard here, these three types of markets all have certain characteristics and they kind of play a certain way, if you will. So if you're looking at a graph, right, with a typical X and Y axis, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see this very well. I can. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, if you're looking at this graph, the typical type of real estate market that most people know about and think think of, right, is the cyclical market. That's the one that everybody talks about and, and thinks about. And it looks like that. It looks like a roller coaster, okay? And that's the typical market. Now, that's the cyclical market. It's got really glorious highs and really ugly lows, and it's got these cycles, thus the name cyclical. And the linear market uh, also has highs and lows, but they're not nearly as pronounced. They go up a little bit and they go down a little bit, but it's it's a much uh, less significant thing, okay? That's the linear market. And then the hybrid market, as the name would suggest, is in between the two, okay? it's uh, It has more pronounced highs, more pronounced lows. I didn't draw that right, but I think you get the idea, okay? Sure. So we like the linear markets because we are cash flow investors. We're looking to invest for yield on our properties, not capital appreciation. Why not? Listen, I love capital appreciation if I can get it. I, I've just never met anybody in all my years in the business who can reliably predict the cycles in the market. You know, I think we all have a sense of when it's going up and coming down, but it's very hard to time it exactly. So let me give you examples of some of these markets, okay? Sure. Cyclical markets would be places like, uh, as you mentioned, Los Angeles. That's my hometown. I grew up in LA. Pretty much uh, the, the coastline. So the California coastline into Portland a little bit, uh, certainly Seattle, cyclical market. Again, markets that get all the headlines, make all the news. South Florida, another cyclical market. The expensive northeastern markets, New York, Washington, D.C., those expensive areas of Connecticut and, and Boston, Massachusetts, cyclical markets, right? Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of the world, though, is a linear market. Now, let's go foreign. Let's go offshore since you have a global audience. Cyclical markets around the world, Paris, London, Dubai, Hong Kong, cyclical market. Really amazing highs. Everybody's talking about it. They're very newsworthy uh, and really ugly lows. When times are bad, people really get hurt in those markets, okay? And again, the vast majority of the world is a linear market. Hybrid markets, on the other hand, in between the two uh, would be places like Denver, Colorado, Austin, Texas, Phoenix, Arizona. Those are hybrid. They're kind of in between, right? They're not crazy, but they're they're a little bit a little bit crazy. And so these linear markets are really good cash flow markets where you can follow my 10 commandments of successful investing and and commandment number 5 is thou shalt not gamble. And what we mean there, George, is the property must make sense the day you buy it or you you simply don't buy it. And how do you know if a property makes sense? Well, cash flow will tell you if it makes sense. That's right. How do you know how do you know what cash flow is? The rent to value ratio or the RV ratio. And what we like to do is try and get around 1% per month of the property value. So if the property is if it costs you $100,000, if you can get $1,000 a month somewhere in that ballpark, mm -hmm. you're doing great. That's a good yeah. deal, okay? Yeah. Um, versus Los Angeles, a cyclical market that doesn't make any sense, there your typical RV or rent-to-value ratio is going to be 0.4 or 0.35. So the example there is a Huge $1 difference. million. Dollar, yeah, well, it's, let's take a $1 million property, just multiply it by 10, okay? A $1 million property in that market, you might get maybe $4,000 a month rent. Not a very good deal at all. So. In the cyclical market, you are automatically a gambler. You are automatically a speculator. Something great has to happen for you to make money, and that something great is appreciation. But what if it doesn't happen? 
you're, you're going broke because you bought a property where you are losing money every month in order to speculate on a potential future, which may never occur. Right. And I, I want to interject something here. And I've heard you say this a lot. And I know that the, whomever's going to push back on this, they're going to say, Jason, yeah, that's right. But boy, you can make so much more money if you invest when the market is low in a place like San Francisco or Seattle. And I recall you actually doing the math. I don't know if it was on your website or you did it on the podcast, but you showed where you actually end up making more money through the income property than you do in these crazy cyclical markets. Can you explain that quickly? Thank you for bringing that up because I can't find that episode where I did that example. <laughs> well, I, I, I know, can attest to it. You did it because I listened I, to it three or four times. I did that about four years ago, and I was looking through my calendar because I distinctly remember I was meeting with two of our clients at Starbucks in La Jolla, California, and one of them, they, they both live there, and, and I lived there for a short time as well, and one of them was saying that, you know, he's doing my strategy, buying these nationwide, these out-of-state properties and little cheap houses for $140,000, but he's also doing San Diego, California, right? Cyclical mm -hmm. market for sure. And he said, you know, I just think the next few years are going to be great in San Diego. And by the way, he turned out to be right, okay? He was right. He did predict that there would be a lot of appreciation and he, he nailed it, okay? He, he got it. But I, I went back and I recorded a podcast right after that, that meeting that morning at Starbucks and I did the math. I just, back of the napkin kind of math, I said, look, if you buy this property for maybe $300,000 and you know he was buying condos in downtown San Diego and if it appreciates at 10 or even 15% annually, which is fantastic appreciation, mm -hmm. You know, very rare that you get that kind of thing. But, you know, a few years of every 10, you do, right, usually. And, and then you look at the cash flow on that property and how much you're losing every month to obtain that appreciation. Right. It was still not a winner, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Compared yeah. to the linear market. Compared to the linear market, yeah. See, in the linear market, um, and I don't remember the example, unfortunately, but I do remember it was it seemed to be valid when I, when I gave the example. I almost think, it, I want to say Indianapolis. Yeah, it, it might have been an Indianapolis property where in that, in that case, you're probably $300 per month positive cash flow and a little cheap $100,000 property at that time. It's not quite as good now, just so you know, but it's still pretty good. You know, on that San Diego property, you might have been, I don't know, $800 or $1,000 a month negative, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at like you're in the whole $12,000 a year in the San Diego property, how much appreciation do you have to have to offset that versus being $300 or what would that be? $3,600 a year positive in Indianapolis. It, it was still not that good a deal. In the, and in you the got so market. much more downside if you yeah. have to have that appreciation, if it never right. comes. And what I always show people is that the chart I like to use going back to 1890 of the US housing market adjusted for inflation. And you see that there's a very specific trend line. And we were, the delta between the trend line and where we were in 2006 was enormous. And a yeah. lot of these markets, it's even higher now. So is it really worth that gamble to your point to risk all that downside when your upside, when we're at all time highs is what, maybe 10, 20% at the most. It just, yeah. to me, it doesn't make any sense. Well, it certainly doesn't make any sense now. Okay, right. Exactly. Uh, to be in a linear market, because I think everyone will agree that if you're speculating now, you are asking for trouble. You're going to have foreclosures, bankruptcy. It's not going to be pretty. Okay, uh, yeah. because we are we are we're late in the cycle. No question about that. I mean, no one would disagree with that except a fool. Uh, but you're right. It, it's just a it's just a very risky thing. Uh, but here are the stories in those cyclical markets of people catching it just right, and I've caught it just right many times in my life. And it's been great. It's a great ride, but yeah. Know, but you know, you know how you I always it. characterize that. Whenever I hear people push back with that, I always because when I first started in business, before I even got into any of that stuff, I was playing blackjack and I was counting cards. So I, I really have this yeah. mindset of <laughs> probabilities, right? And it, mm -hmm. it stuck with me to this day. And the analogy that I always use when people say, yeah, but I would have missed out on the last two years of appreciation. I say, listen, if you're at the blackjack table and you've got a 19, 
and you hit. Yeah, you're, you're going to go bust. <laughs> but, but, but let's say you get a two. Yeah. But let's say you get a two and you get blackjack. Does that mean that does, does that mean that you made the right decision? I would say so, absolutely no, you got lucky. not, because you got if you lucky. make that over and over again, you're going to go bust. But mm -hmm. a lot of these people, they they talk about the past years of gains, even mm -hmm. though the probability of making those gains was extremely low, just like your probability of winning if you hit on a 19 is extremely low. Actually, I'm not a gambler, but that's a great metaphor you just made. I just thought of the connection. See, in, in the past 10 years, if you're sitting at that blackjack table buying income properties, you're getting the best cards in that deck. Say there's 52 cards, but there's really probably four decks, right? There's, uh, you know, there's 200 and in six card or 208 cards or something, right? You've gotten all of the good cards out of that shoot already in the past 10 years. The likelihood of more good cards coming late in the cycle is extremely low. Yeah. So and, that, that's a good, that's a good metaphor. I know. Yeah, and I would take that. it a step further. If you're using what we call basic strategy in blackjack, mm -hmm. you're never going to hit on that 19. Now you might lose, you might miss out on a couple blackjacks, but since you're betting with the probabilities in the long run, you're always going to come out ahead. And it's just mm -hmm. like income properties because you're playing with the odds on your side. As long as you continue to do that over the long term, you're always going to come out ahead. Or if you risk that, if you risk hitting on a 19 by going into these cyclical markets, you might have a winner here and there. But if you do it over the long term, you're going to lose. Yeah, you're very right.